I have so many fellows that I loved who were wounded. Of our original thousand men, I would say half of them were wounded or killed. Half the originals. When man abends irgendwie von bei Auftrag nach Haus kommt und und du erfährst, sagt er, dein Freund da liegt da, ne, da ist dann haben wir gerade jetzt beerdigt. Hat man selbst mal die Schaufel in die Hand genommen, hat selbst das gemacht. Ja, das sind die schlimmsten Momente. I could still cry for some of them. Because they were nice guys, you know, and they all got killed. Here they died. And here, eight years later, I'm still alive. Oh, up with that luck. Faith, guardian angels with me. You tell me, because I don't know. Khan was a city that they had to capture. We had to get Khan first. Our assignment was to attack Khan. Khan is a very large city. And it, it, just one, one battalion could never take on in a thousand years. The Germans had the Hitler youth in there. They would fight to the end. That Hitler youth, they were, they, they would not surrender. I have always said that that's what they have won. I have always been a Gute Hitleranhänger gewesen. Sie haben also bis zum Ende dran geglaubt, dass Deutschland gewinnt, ja, bis zum Ende. Wir hatten diese Front gehalten im Gegensatz zum Plan der Alliierten. Die wollten ja am ersten Tag der Invasion schon kaum erobern. Es hat aber gedauert bis zum 10. Juli. So lange hatten wir da noch stillgehalten. The Royal Air Force sent a thousand bombers over. They bombed that place all night. You could hear them droning over, and you could hear the bombs. We were only, as I say, we were only a mile away. That is the Himmel auf, und dann kam die Bomber mit tausend Stück und die laden ab. Dann war es vorbei, ja. All day and all night, millions of shells helping to win this close bloody and ferocious battle in Normandy, making the force of France a pitted and hideous thing, yet helping to shorten the war. And the next morning, the British and Canadians attacked. The British on the left, the Canadians on the right. Were you scared? I suppose at times, but not, not generally speaking because there were too much to think about. If you had to just think about yourself, I guess you'd be kind of worried, but you had your, a job to do. I changed my dog tags from Hebrew to a Protestant because I didn't know where I was going to be. And if I'm captured by the enemy, the chances I'd survive if I change my indication on my dog tags. Khan, it was quite a battle, and we lost quite a number of men there. We're on this ridge. There's Harold Burden on the left, Alec Duncan in the middle, and myself on the right, the three of us lying there together. All of a sudden, there's a tremendous explosion. And I finally wake up, and I, Harold Burden says, how are you feeling? I said, well, I guess I'm all right. And I look over, and Alec Duncan's had his legs blown right off. We just looked at him, he was dead. He didn't have any legs at all. Imagine the, the three of us lying side by side. I could, I could touch everybody. Yeah. 
Amazing. There's a lot of damage, you know, the buildings down and bodies here and there. God. We went to one place and we went to the went to the right and two Canadian Scottish had been killed. We don't know how they got there. It's an odd thing, just sort of wonder. It's pretty awful to see your own guys dead. That's the worst thing. If the German soldiers didn't bother you. After we captured our portion of Khan, we had to get into position to attack the barrier ridge. Barrier ridge was a, a guiding point for the Germans to hold back the enemy. It was a good place to stop us. As day uh, broke, we advanced up the hill. The Germans were waiting with armor and heavy machine guns. It's a wheat field. These Germans were all dug in, and they were all dug in in haystacks. All of a sudden, a burst of fire would come out from behind a haystack. Rain of steel, that's exactly what it was, a rain of steel. And still we attack. Punch, punch, and punch. And if the German doesn't break, punch him again. He hasn't broken yet. Every yard of our advance is sticky. The Black Watch eventually won Verrier's Ridge. The Black Watch lost a lot of men there. Yes, and other Canadians, too. We lost 400 men. It was a terrible day. When the first Canadian army surged forward, it included not only British and Canadian formations, but also a Polish armored division. The presence of these comrades in arms in our sector is released for the first time today. We were attacking along Confalais Road. Uh, fourth Canadian division on the right side of the road, and we were on the left side of the road. We were waiting for the bombardment, who's supposed to be, to be starting at uh, 1, 1 p.m. So we had plenty of time, there was nothing to do. Beautiful sunshine, uh, and we're waiting for this bombardment. A thousand heavy bombers sailed in to overwhelm the German position in the woods on our right. And it had to be accurate, because in a close, packed battlefield like this, a small inaccuracy could kill our own men. I remember seeing the planes flying over our head and starting to bomb where we knew were our front lines. It was pretty bad, pretty bad feeling. American planes came over and made a mistake and bombed us. They didn't bomb the Germans. They, they bombed Canadian and, and some Persians, really, mostly Canadians. We never expected this to happen. Shrapnel, shrapnel from these big bombs was whizzing by. And I thought, you know, I don't know how I'm going to live through this. But do I want my backbone taken out or my belly taken out? And I kept turning around this way. <laughs> and I, it was a, a rather frightening moment. My regiment lost 26 tanks in 45 minutes. We had tremendous losses, uh, almost uh, 80, 80 men. Uh, killed and wounded, 25 killed and uh, burned down and uh, less wounded. We were bombed several times by Americans, not only last one. Americans were trigger happy. A thousand planes did a hell of a lot of damage there. It's not a good feeling. The tactical opportunity is now clear. A total encirclement of von Kluger's entire 7th German Army. The British are at the rear of this grand pincer movement, and American troops form the lower jaw. The 1st Canadian Army, with the Poles, form the upper jaw. Their job is to move south and close the gap near the strongly held fortress town of Falaise, trapping the German army once and for all. We're in south of Caen, and the British and the Polish were all together, you know, pushing the enemy south, push, push, push. 
trying to trap the German 7th Army because George Patton was coming up from the south and we were pushing from the north. If we could close in on the German 7th Army, we could certainly destroy them, it would shorten the war. And that was a key issue. And that's what we try to do. At last, the movement order arrived. The full weight of Canadian armor forges ahead. Layer after layer of stubbornly contested defense lines crumble as it advances astride the police highway. Because we're getting close to the front. We're here in the gun positions. I was frightened. I was scared. I was a kid. I didn't understand what was happening, but I learned. I got accustomed to it. Your body either accepts it or you don't live with it. And I accepted it. If you're looking at the terrain, you have all this rolling gullies, what have you. And so one minute they're in front of you, another minute they're beside you, another time they're in behind you. Germans? Yes. The Germans had a gun called the 88. Every other gun you could hear by the whistle go <whistles> But the 88 it went so fast that it landed first, then you heard the whistle afterwards. Knocked out a lot of tanks, killed a lot of people. That, that's frightening. of enemy resistance was broken. Canadians and British fight their way into the suburbs of Palais. The town is a mass of ruins from our aerial bombardment. It is necessary to fight for it street by street. Fanatical Nazi snipers still try to hold up our advance. The driver got killed, the sergeant got wounded, and my radio operator got very badly wounded. What's that like when, uh, when a man beside you gets wounded? You to help them. You do the best you can to, to, to keep them alive, to keep going. Und dann kam die große Offensive und da ging es dann rapide zurück. Alliierten durchgebrochen und wir mussten zurückweichen, aber es ist uns nicht gelungen, rechtzeitig die Kurve zu kriegen und das Ergebnis war dann der Kessel von Falaise. This is the Valet's Pocket. General Patton's 3rd American Army holds firm in the south, and the Poles fight on Mount Ormel to the east. It falls to the Canadians to block the Germans' only escape route, a short stretch of road southeast of Falaise. Von Kluger's 7th Army desperately tries to escape, but for the Germans, there is no hiding place from the fury of our guns. We eventually got through the Falaise, into the Falaise Gap, as they called it, to try to surround the German 7th Army. My regiment was ordered to close the Falaise Gap itself. You had the Americans on one side, Canadians on the other side, and they were closing, and that was the only route of escape was the Mont Orbel. In the great pocket to the southwest of us are many German divisions trying to disengage and fighting bitterly to prevent annihilation. Ja, wir waren eingekesselt. Die ganze Armee West war eingekesselt. Und da hieß es, wir müssen hier wieder rauskommen. To get by these guys was very, very difficult. These Germans were trained to fight to the end, and they did. The carnage was incredible. Germans were retreating, but they were retreating in a bottleneck so that they were uh, an easy target, especially for, from the air. There was tremendous casu German casualties in the Falaise Gap. Our own Tiffies were starting to have a field day engaging the retreating Germans. As far as the Falaise Gap, a lot of our work was done at low level, and we could pick up the odor of battle uh, from the smoke and the dead horses. It was just a killing field, something I'll remember as long as I live. 
problems. Every time he went forward, he'd go into farm areas, there's dead horses and animals. There's one place where there's a few dead and the farmer's out there trying to clean out, trying to clean out those shrapnel wounds on the horses. Of course, we had farmers with us, right? So first thing you know, our, our guys were out there helping the farmer clean up the wounds on the animals. Well, that's the kind of guys we had. I've never, never in all my life seen such a horrendous amount of death. The RCAF must have strafed a convoy to, to the left in the, in the field of, of this road. I bet without any hesitation, boats that there was a hundred dead, German dead, headless, legless, dead, and d dead animals, terrible. Terrible. I never in my born days ever ever seen anything so so horrendous as that. This week may decide vast issues. We know that the German army is on the point of cracking. With Felice in our hands, the encirclement is complete. In utter confusion, the Nazis attempt every means of escape. There are but two means left, imprisonment or death. A number of Germans was able to escape in, the, in, the, in all this chaos. We were all very eingezingelt. And we had to get out of here. And we, the wind and the vision, we had the kessel broken in one night. They didn't close that pocket completely. The Polish and the Canadians were at the end of that pocket, and uh, the Germans escaped whatever possible way they can. There was a commando zusammengesetzt. Die Panzer, die noch da waren, wo wir noch Sprit für hatten, und fuhren auf breiter Front mit 10 oder 15 Panzer, die noch da waren, rammelten sie da durch in der Nacht. Und da hieß es, wir sind frei. After we sealed that road, we got the Germans cut off them totally because the British were on one side and Canadians were on the other side. They were trapped. They estimated the 12th SS pretty good. That must have felt satisfying. It was. It was pretty nice. nice pretty nice feeling. After a terrific mauling by Canadian infantry early in the attack, 2,000 men from this division alone give up. They were coming in surrendering because they knew they were beat. They knew that. The older Germans, they surrendered very peacefully. You know, they come maybe from a mile or two away. They hold their hands up, maybe have a hanky in their hand or something to signify that they're surrendering, like a white hanky. But then when you got to the SS, that was a different story. They didn't give up until they threw the last bullet at you, or then they'd throw the rifle at you, and then maybe they'd holler and excuse them, don't shoot. We have so many prisoners, you know. We have on the hills, we don't know what to do with us prisoners. We have about 5,000 prisoners, so we have 2,000 of us. We closed in, we captured over 50,000, as I can recollect and we killed quite a number of them. Afterwards, when we looked around and checked all the vehicles that were knocked out in there, it, it was one horrible sight. There was dead bodies all over the place. It wasn't a pretty sight, believe me. We did see bodies all over the bloody fields. They become bloated after a while. It was August. And it was, the heat was terrible at that time. And it doesn't take long for them to blow up. That's the first time I could realize that there was a death smell from a lot of people getting killed there. And the bodies lay in there for some time before they were buried. There was such a stench you couldn't believe, the smell of death. It, it has never left me. We had bulldozers of some sort. 
making way through dead Germans. Ich hab, ich hab Dinge erlebt, wenn sie nachts, wenn sie, wenn sie nachts durch so ein Dorf fahren und und fahren über über aufgedunsene Rind, Rinderleuchen, die in der Sonne aufgedunsen waren und nachts sind Panzer drüber gefahren und und sie müssen da durch, wenn wenn sie das erleben als Soldat, wenn sie sehen, wie Verwundete schreien, wie, wie wenn sie sehen, da liegen tote Kameraden, dann das was was sich einprägt. Talk to some of the German officers. They could speak good English, better than we could. And they said that, as far as Germany was concerned, they had lost the war. But that little corporal in Berlin, he wouldn't give it up. So. Do you remember the Leopold Canal? Oh, yes. How, I, how would I forget the Leopold Canal? Yes, we were there at the Leopold Canal. That was the worst fighting that I was in in the whole of Europe, tougher than the beach. One guy said to me, he says, they, they said hell was hot. He says, no, it's cold, it's wet, and it's miserable. It's the Leopold Canal. That's where hell is. Lightning war indeed, beyond anything the Germans dreamed of. It was World War II, and I saw so much going on. I just had to get into it. And I knew if I waited until I was 18, it'd be too late. I was 16 when I joined the Army in March 1943. But didn't the recruiting officer note how old you were? No, I think I looked older. I was tall, as I am now. Is that legal? No. <laughs> Canadian military vehicles are on the move again in Belgium to be greeted enthusiastically by the citizens of another liberated town. I joined the regiment as a 17-year-old. 17, that's pretty young. Well, I told them a big lie, but they, they, they believe me. They believe me, like thousands of others. The Western Allies captured their greatest prize since Paris the huge Belgian port of Antwerp. But ships could only reach the inland harbor by steaming up the Scheldt estuary, where the enemy still hangs on. The Allies needed Antwerp, but the Scheldt estuary is a sea channel that led all the way into Antwerp. And on each side of the Scheldt had been well defended by the German soldiers. And they had given the orders to, the, to their soldiers in the Scheldt estuary that if anybody was surrendered, their family would be committed back in Germany. They'd do something to the family. They had to fight, stay, and stay where they are. The task of clearing the enemy from the Scheldt estuary has been given to the 1st Canadian Army. The 2nd Division will move north around Antwerp, while the 3rd Division will destroy German resistance on the southern side, starting at the Leopold Canal. The Leopold Canal. That's where I saw my first action. Platoon commander said to me, I got a job for you. I want you to cross the canal. See what you can find at the crossroads up the, on the other side of the cops. I said, yes, sir. First light, we went over. And there was a moon shining, I remember that and the moon, how it reflects on the water, and you think it's shining right on you, you know. Any minute, we expect to see a burst of machine gun fire on us, you know. 
you're more afraid of letting your side down than you are of being killed. After we got across the canal, we were on like a ridge on one side from the water up, but you could almost hear the, well, you could hear the Germans talking on the other side of this high bank. When we got across, there was an outfit there having breakfast in the basement of the, one of the houses. What were their faces like when you walked in? Shocked. Shocked. <laughs> They had no idea we were there. And there's a car outside. I said to my buddy, Dale Sharp, what are we going to do with this guy? Hook, he says, you jump him, and I'll stab him. And I jumped him, and he jarred him right into the neck with, it, with, with, the, with his, uh, his dagger. And he yelled as he screamed as, as he was uh, Painted it, you know. Uh, that was our first experience. To free the approaches to Antwerp, Canadians launch attacks on enemy held territory on both banks of the Scheldt estuary. There was a tremendous artillery barrage. It was screaming right over our heads because they, it had to hit the, the houses on the other side of us. So it was only maybe just a few feet above our head. I think I am relatively a brave man, but I was terrified because you can expect a shell to explode right beside you. You can, you can expect a sniper. You can expect uh, anything. If you're lucky enough to escape all that, you're, you're alive. If not, you're not. What a young person has going for them in joining the Army, they have that mantle of security that people are getting killed, but it's not going to happen to me. If you were to be told that tomorrow in the attack, we expect that everyone will be killed except one man. You say, boy, I'm going to be lonely tomorrow afternoon. Now, that's how you think. On the Leopold Canal, the grenade had a, what they call a four-second fuse in it. The fighting there was so close that it would take the grenade, flip the handle, count the two, and toss it because the, it was so close, the, the, with a count of four, that, more, that if a guy was brave enough, he had a chance to throw it back at you. That's how close that was. A German hand grenade landed right beside me. And their grenades were like, my mother used to have an old wooden potato masher. And these things looked similar to that. So when it landed, I just grabbed it, tossed it up high up over the back to on their side. We're holding on for a dear life. We had what they call flamethrowers. And these flamethrowers, they're something like a tank, not as large as that tank, but they'd come up and they just, this ball of flame was just, I don't know, it exploded. You'd see all the flames, and you'd see the people scattering out of there. Some on fire. Germans. Germans, oh, yes. I was trained on the flamethrower. We had to use it, but it's a horrible thing to use. We could see them coming out and trying to put the flame out off their backs because they weren't, like, they weren't in a too far deep behind. But the uh, uh, flame got them, you know. And then when they start running and screaming, you know, that they're on fire and it was a horrible thing. So I, I, I hate to even think of it, you know, how horrible it was, even if it was your enemy. But uh, it was still a horrible thing to watch. 
there was a fire complement, and they had been firing on this farm field. We got down there, the slaughtered animals. Oh, there was one little calf. The top of his head was gone, and I dispatched it with my 303. There was horses trying to get out of the burning building, and they had the space between the wall and the ground, and their heads were out of there trying to get through that hole to get out of the fire. I felt more, more sorry for the animals, I think, than I did the people. The first man I ever killed, he's got his rifle slung on his shoulder, a young fella. He got within about 10 feet of me, and he took the rifle off, off his shoulder. I says, you better do something now, or he's going to do something. And I shot him right in the chest, and he fell at my feet, dead. I don't think he was 15 years of age, a young German guy. How'd it feel? Lovely. No remorse at all. Our section was vastly outnumbered. The lieutenant says, let's get out of here. He finally realized the situation we were in. We were surrounded. He just came right over us. And so the lieutenants. Uh, how, how, how many of them? What did it look like? Oh, probably 30, I guess. German soldiers? Yeah, yeah. And they came over, and uh, before we knew it, they were all around us. Uh, so the lieutenant stand up, stood up and says, I apologize for getting you into this, lads. He says, but we're going to have to surrender. Twelve of us surrendered. And I thought, Christ, they're going to shoot us. We came up with our hands up. And most of us, they are pretty well all wounded, bandaged and whatnot. I thought that they would string me up to the nearest post. Do you know? They were friendly to me. I was driven by a sergeant to a first aid hospital. I couldn't believe it. It was a brick school, one story. It was a, they had a long hallway, and it was full of stretchers. Outside was full of stretchers, waiting to get into the hallway. The shouting and screaming that was going on, fellows burnt, bodies burnt terribly by our flamethrowers and whatnot. <sighs> fellows mutilated. It was hell. Germans? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I didn't see them as Germans. They were human beings. I know all's fair in love and war, but when a country lives on the principles of killing the Jews, the political uh, enemies, gypsies, insane, infirm people, putting them through the miseries of, of those uh, concentration camps. Germans were di dirty bastards, dirty. No use for them. Do you still feel that way? Right to this very moment. They attacked at night, they attacked in the morning. They attacked and attacked and attacked. They, they tried to drive us off there, but that's, that's where the typhoons come in. They're hitting targets about 50 yards in front of us. Earth was just shaking like that. And of course, it was all sand and the slit trips that begin to fall in. People don't know what war is like. I don't often sit here and talk about that. The 
was getting towards evening, you know, and everything was quiet. And uh, I guess for the last time that night, some German decided to fire one of the moaning minis. Till today, I can swear I heard a voice. What did the voice say? Get out of here now. Like a very strict order, get out of here now. And there was nobody around me to say that. There wasn't anybody within maybe 200 yards. So I took off, ran 20, 25 yards away. Where did it head? In that trench. When I got out of there, I never got a scratch or anything. I got a bit of a concussion from the explosion. The minister said, well, God knows I've been with you, you know. Yeah, but there were millions of other guys that needed help, too. How could he handle all that? They took us prisoner. They loaded us up in the boxcars. You hardly had room to stand up. We were so crowded. There was no food, no water, no sanitation, and half of the fellows were down with dysentery. Oh, that was a, that was rock bottom. After that, it was never the same. I thought how terrible it was for us to be living in those conditions. But how much worse was it for those Jews they put in those boxcars with their children? You wouldn't have just yourself to look after. And of the six million Jews, how many prayers were sent up for help? And how much help did they get? I gave up right there. Gave up religion? Yeah. They took us to Stalag 11B. That was hard. There were Canadians and Americans and British in this camp. There was probably 10,000 in there. I think I had lost my spirit. I think I really hit bottom. One day, our interpreter told us that we were going to start on the march. That's where they keep you marching, just to keep you out of the hands of the advancing allies. So he says, if anybody's thinking of escaping, you better do it now. And then they marched us along the road, and two of us escaped. We ran like deer for hours till we couldn't run anymore. I had been on patrol with Dale Sharp, and that's my partner. Dale and I, we see these two fellows, two Germans, going around this farmyard. I said, Dale, We'll see what we can do with these, see if we can get these guys, get kill one and take the other one prisoner for information. He says, we'll do our best. Little did we know that two guys are following us. They must realize that we saw them too. The fellow shot me. I was badly wounded. I said, this is the end. There's no way I'm going to get out of this. But how did you get away? How come the Germans didn't capture you? Dale Sharp shot them and, and carried me out. Brave guy. Brave guy. He was later to be killed. You must have felt grateful to him. Oh, as I say, I go to his, I go to his grave, grave site every year. I've done so for the last 35 years. Yeah. We were too weak. We had no food. We had no compass. We had nothing. 
This last morning, I got to the edge of the forest, and I went in, crawled on my knees because I didn't want to get shot. So I pushed the bushes away, and there was a Sherman tank on its side with its gun helplessly pointed to, up to the sky, and this gray, brown beret or black beret fella cursing and swearing over his, jeet, his tank. And I, like a fool, I came bursting out of there. He could have... He could have shot me. You know, I could see this apparition. I had a green German jacket. I had a French hat and British battle dress trousers. And oh, God, I love, and shaved head, skinny as a rail. And I came over and I hugged that tank. And I, and I cried. <laughs> he says, who the, who the, he says, who the bloody hell are you? I says, I'm a Canadian prisoner of war. We couldn't believe our luck. Yeah, we're going home. How old are you now? I'm still 18. Our forces have swept the Scheldt estuary clean of Nazis, opening the largest port in Europe, Antwerp. We can now supply our armies for the final assault on Germany. As the first Allied convoys of big ships arrive, Canadian soldiers feel the pride of achievement. Every one of us have a guilt complex when we come back. You know, to this day, to this day, I have the feeling that I've been living on borrowed time my whole life because I don't know why, why I wasn't killed. And, and they were. <laughs>